I am more bullish than I've ever been about crypto, and I really am. I've been working on this for 11 years, and I've sort of seen not just the 11 years in crypto, but I've seen many, many technology market cycles uh, as well in the internet as a whole, dating back to like 1990. So I've sort of seen decades of sort of these cycles of technology adoption, improvement, market activity, et cetera. It feels to me when I look at the combination of the maturity of blockchain network infrastructure, some of the fundamental primitives that are becoming possible in terms of user experience and abstracting away the complexity of interacting with this technology and the legal certainty that's coming, that's really, really important. When you, when you put those, those things together, it really feels like we're, 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 we're coming onto that moment where this can really, really go to internet scale. We're right now crossing the chasm. Jeremy, I want to go all the way back to the beginning of your time in crypto. How and when did you first enter the space? I think a lot of people want to know, was there sort of a eureka moment that made you want to focus all of your time and your energy on this industry? And if so, where did that happen? Yeah, there, there really was. So I first became um, interested in crypto in 2012. And I think uh, my, my background is as like an internet technologist, software entrepreneur. And um, in 2012, I started reading about Bitcoin first. Um, and was just very intrigued. I actually had a background in uh, what I kind of describe as international political economy, so sort of economics, political science, the sort of, had, had spent a lot of time thinking about like the international monetary system, like completely separate from crypto. It was just an interest of mine. And so I naturally became really interested given my background in working on like open software infrastructure on the internet and sort of seeing Bitcoin. Um, and, and being very curious as a technologist, like, wow, this is, a, this is a protocol, this is a distributed computing innovation. And so I was very interested in it as a technical innovation, but also as like a monetary system innovation. And, and really, I think for me, like the first time that I like s sort of synchronized the Bitcoin blockchain onto my like laptop and, and conducted my first, you know, Bitcoin transaction was a total eureka moment. And I've had a couple of those in my career. I think um, like in September of 1993, I downloaded the first um, graphical web browser. It had just come out like two days before. And I'd been an internet, like been involved in the internet for a number of years before that. But then I was like, okay, there was a huge eureka in terms of like what the web would become and that like I committed myself to helping build the web. And so then at that point, like I was just like, okay, this is the next logical infrastructure layer of the internet. This is, I can actually see a, a path to this actually being like foundational to the way all economic activity in the world is organized. And like, I, I can see like working on it for decades. And I just sort of said, this is what I'm doing. And, um, and, and, and fairly quickly like developed the fundamental thesis and ideas behind Circle. Um, and that was really in early 2013 at that point. Yeah. Right, I was just gonna ask actually, so briefly take me through that journey of, you know, you have the Eureka moment and then you've obviously, you know, there's been a lot of milestones along the way until we're here at ETC in 2024 in Brussels. What are some of the highlights for you over that last, uh, what, 11 years now? Yeah. I mean, look, there, there, there are a lot. <laughs> I'll, have to con I'll condense it uh, very quickly. Like, I think um, the first was sort of this, you know, this sort of founding belief that, um, you know, when I looked at the technology back in 2013, there was a sort of belief that the technology would mature to a point where blockchains would be scalable, they could support much larger volume of usage, that blockchains would allow you to issue other um, assets on top of them, not just the native token like the Bitcoin token, but issue other assets, and that the the concept of of like running a compute engine on these networks and a virtual machine that you could actually write smart contracts with, all of those were like things that back then I thought, okay, I, I think those things are going to happen, and uh, you know, thought it might take three, four, five years, which is kind of what how long it took until Ethereum matured, but like very early we focused on how do we connect actual real money in the existing kind of government-backed money world? How do we connect that to these blockchain networks and, and begin to figure out a way to kind of legally make that work? And so we, we became like, you know, some big milestones were sort of becoming licensed to actually like connect dollars to blockchains to, you know, uh, to, to sort of enable kind of like regulated interaction between the existing financial system and this new, you know, blockchain-based system. And, 
And, and eventually, though, like a huge milestone was, you know, really in 2016 when I kind of considered like Ethereum still in beta, but like the primitives were there. And so we got very excited that we could now execute this idea of like a protocol for dollars on the internet. And so we kind of conceptually designed what we wanted USDC to be in 2017, and we launched it in 2018. And But we had already built up so much infrastructure in terms of banking and crypto infrastructure and licenses that we were actually able to like legally and compliantly launch this dollar digital currency. So that was a huge milestone when, when we launched USDC itself, because it was like, OK, we're now starting to like realize the fundamentals of the idea. And you know, sort of fast forward now, it's been six years since we launched USDC. And, um, it, it's incredible, like, you know, when I think about a lot of milestones along the way, but like last week, uh, which was July, the week of July 1st, um, you know, it was, I viewed July 1st, 2024 as a major milestone because um, basically, you know, USDC and our Euro stablecoin, ERC, became legal electronic money in the entire European Union. And like, that's like such a huge deal. It's the first major, you know, market um, and, and, and kind of country slash region that uh, where like what we've done is now legally part of the of the financial system and and so it's sort of a turning point in my view from like the early adopter phase of this into what I think is going to be like the mainstream global scaling phase of this and and I view like July 1st uh, 2024 as sort of a, a big milestone along that journey. Thank you for bringing us up to date with that uh, with that time. I, th I think it's it's quite important for the audience to understand, you know, where it all began and, and yeah. the sort of key milestones and, and where we are now. I do have some questions for you about the the recent updates uh, and the regulatory changes. But before we get there, I, I just want to get your sort of thoughts on the industry as a whole because you know we're here during ETC. Yeah. Um, we were at the um, RWA summit yesterday, um, and as much as there's so many different talking points in the industry. Um, your name actually popped up a few times with with our interviewees, who said they were either attending, um, you know, panels with you or fireside chats. Um, so I'm I'm curious about your thoughts uh, on the growing RWA space, yeah. given that they seem to be quite familiar with with the work that you're doing for obvious reasons. Um, how do you view the rapidly growing RWA space? I mean, I think it's it, it's it's a huge area um, and one we're very involved with. Um, I mean, I think in in simple terms, right? If if basically people are taking existing investable assets and they're tokenizing them um, and they're bringing them on chain, like if you want to be able to like either purchase or sell or create or redeem or do these things, you need cash. You need a digital cash to do that. And so USDC, because it's sort of a legal form of this electronic money, this digital cash electronic money, um, it is sort of the natural, um, you know, kind of settlement asset for for moving between, you know, cash and these these RWAs. And so, what we found is that like all these different RWA projects around the world and tokenization projects, they're all building in, you know, our stablecoin um, infrastructure as as part of what they do. And what's amazing to me, and this gets to like part of the vision that we had early on, is like this idea of like open permissionless, programmable, composable money is like this. That was like really what got me excited in 2013. I, I've, I've worked on programming languages, developer tools, app platforms. Like in my career, I've built a lot of these things. And so the idea of programmable money that's like on the public internet is like so radical. And so tokeni tokenization and RWAs are like really bringing that to life in, in, in new ways. And so we're obviously still in the super, super early stages of that. And obviously there's like charts and they're up and to the right and like people are, are excited about it. But like when you actually think about the, the to like if you'd like look at like global equity and, and debt markets, it's like, you know, uh, it's, it's like 200 and, Fifty trillion dollars, or it's like some enormous number, and so like the, the the size of of like assets that can actually come on chain and become you know transactable and exchangeable and 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 otherwise programmable is like it's enormous. So it's a super exciting space, and we're happy to be you know explicitly and implicitly partnering with so many of the projects as well. Gotcha. I, I want to ask you a few questions about stable coins because got mentioned there a few times in that, in that previous response. And I want to begin, obviously, with the very big news. You touched on it. Um, Circles announced that USDC and URC, ERC are uh, available under e new EU stablecoin laws. I think that's you know groundbreaking. 
Uh, and that makes Circle the first global stablecoin issuer to be compliant with, with MICA. Could you just briefly update us on the developments that led to that? Uh, and from your perspective, what's Circle's involvement in these regulatory changes? Yeah. So I think, at, you know, multiple years ago, th there's a, a lot that people don't realize how much has gone on in the background, which is, you know, it, it kind of started actually with Libra. <laughs> so Libra, which was, of course, Zuckbucks, uh, you know, kind of got announced as a white paper. And um, basically, like, governments around the world, especially the biggest governments with the biggest currencies, like the Eurozone, the dollar, all these, like, kind of freaked out. And basically, they were obviously announcing, like, this idea of a global stablecoin. They had their own design and their own blockchain and all these other things that they were trying to do with it. We had already launched USDC. We were in the market. We were more of a bottom-up. Like, we're not Facebook, right? We're a bottom-up. We're building from the ground up. But what was interesting is it really was, it was perceived by global governments as this is happening. Like, stable coins are happening. And we need to have a clear set of rules for how stable coins are going to work. If, 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 if there is going to be this, these stable coins and they're going to interact with the existing financial system, there needs to be, there needs to be a way to, to, to regulate that. And so that led to you know, through the G20, it led to the, the body of all the basically, all the biggest regulators in the world through what's called the Financial Stability Board, they all got together and sort of said, okay, we need global stablecoin policy. It took them like two years to develop it. We consulted to that, lots of projects, MakerDAO, lots of different projects consulted on, on sort of stablecoin policy. And then it was adopted at the G20. They voted on it and said, we wanna do this. And so then what happens is, you have like this framework and you can go back and you can look at like the policy recommendations that the G20 came out with, then all the members of the G20 are essentially saying, we're gonna go and put in place laws. And so the way laws get put in place in the US is through Congress, in the EU, it's the EU Parliament and all these, you know, I'm not an expert in, in, in EU lawmaking, but um, in all these jurisdictions, basically, all these governments said, we're gonna commit to doing this. And so that's coming online. And so we knew this was all coming online everywhere in the world. And our view is like, this is a really positive development. If we want this kind of innovation to be accessible globally and to become like to actually have an internet financial system, like having clear laws around the world is really key. So when when Mika was sort of being um, agreed upon, we looked at that as a, a huge milestone, and it was clearly like an enormous region that was going to be at the forefront of this, ahead of other major regions. Um, really, the only other major jurisdiction that was ahead of the EU on this is Japan, which had stablecoin regulations that went into effect a year ago. And so the moment that came, we said, okay, this is a really big opportunity. We also were focused on launching a Euro stable coin. So the day Mika was announced as, as an agreement, it was actually the day we launched EURC. Um, and we made a public statement saying, we're committed to bringing this under, under you know, these new EU rules when they go effective. And so then we really did spend the last couple of years working with regulators, working with policymakers, providing input into how this could work. And I think really crucially, and this is part of the breakthrough of what we announced last week, is how can you have a fungible globally available digital dollar like USDC that is simultaneously issued and regulated in the EU and issued and regulated in the United States and, and make that work. And we did find a way to make that work under these, uh, the, these EU laws. And, and that's a really big deal. And I think it's a testament to sort of how we operate and, and, what, and, and, and how we run things that we've been able to do that. But I think um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a really major milestone. I certainly think so too. And on that note, what, what do you, as you see them, the implications of USDC being, you know, natively issued in the EU, and um, what are perhaps the main implications for end users? Is it going to be uh, from a distribution standpoint? Will EU banks be more likely to hold USDC or EURC? Uh, what are the sort of major changes that we can expect to see in the near future? Yeah, I think about it in their sort of short, medium, and long term. I think in the short run. Um, you know, part of what, what Mika is, is doing is sort of saying, hey, there is this big market already, and it's the market for digital assets, and there's now a framework for, for regulating how digital asset products and services are, are sold, marketed, offered, uh, et cetera, in the EU. And that, that spans both electronic money, like stable coins, as well as like other products that, that people are offering, exchanges, brokerages, investments, all these kinds of things. And so now that you have that, um, you know, it, it sort of defines that space, and I think um, 
because digital asset markets, whether it's DeFi or centralized exchanges or other things, so heavily dependent on stable coins, including dollar stable coins, I think it, in the short term it creates a really great opportunity to grow USDC in Europe, right? Because we we are sort of this available, compliant, liquid, you know, you know, instrument that now can be used. And so, in the short term, I think it's it's a great opportunity to grow how much USDC is used by European people and entities and, and businesses. Over the medium term, we see this as an opportunity to grow Euro stablecoin adoption as well. Um, to date, like Euro stablecoin adoption has been really, really limited because most of the activity has been like in trading markets, and trading markets are pr principally denominated in, in dollars. And it's not because people don't want to hold Euro. I mean, people everywhere here hold Euro because that's where they're paid, and that's how they pay for goods and services and taxes and all that fun stuff. Um, so now that you have clear regulations on, on crypto assets and on digital asset markets, we believe that you're going to start to see more and more corporations, traditional financial institutions, others who want to get into this space. And as they get into this space, they're going to want to transact in the regional currency. And so that will create more demand for Euro stablecoin. So we actually think over the medium term, this will grow Euro stablecoin adoption. And then over the long run, um, you know, we, we, our own belief is like on-chain money is superior to, to legacy electronic money. Programmable, composable money is superior to open banking, like uh, the efficiencies of, of, of blockchains that effectively provide settlement finality and you know, ultimately you know, fractions of a, of, of, a, of a second and transaction costs that are fractions of a penny, like, that that's going to be really attractive. And eventually, we expect like, Euro stablecoins to become highly competitive in retail payment systems in Europe as well. And um, the innovations of things like NFTs, social commerce, um, the, the ability to have different types of customer engagement as, as merchants and brands using Web3 technology. Like, we think Web3 user experiences in commerce, Web3 user experiences in, in social, and in payments will kind of converge and will drive um, a, a, a next wave of, of innovation in, in, in retail experiences. Like we, the best that kind of most of the world has is sort of like the neobanking products. Um, but I think Web3 allows for kind of like a next generation of, of, of application experiences, maybe more similar to like what Tencent had been able to do with like WeChat, um, but all like open, composable, programmable, interoperable, built on a Web3 technology stack. Quite a few potential implications there. And yeah. I think a lot of people are looking forward to, to seeing them materialize. I'm, I'm curious what you think these, these changes mean for, you know, the, the idea between regulated versus unregulated stable coins. Um, is it possible in the not so distant future that we see unregulated stable coins getting phased out? Um, more specifically still, what does this mean for Tether and USDT, um, you know, which is now the leading stable coin by market cap? Is there a possibility that you know unregulated stablecoins are phased out, or are they just going to have to get regulated the way USDC has? I mean, I, I think there's sort of a couple things. It's sort of like what is the market doing, and then what is what is the regulatory guidance? And so um, the European Banking Authority, which is the authority over this, issued their explicit guidance on this issue actually in a statement on July 5th, so last Friday. And I, I think they're very clear about like any anyone who's sort of listing, offering, selling, promoting to the public um, a stable coin that is not MICA conformant, that that is, that is no longer allowed, right? And so I think there's sort of, broadly the industry sort of perceives there to be a time period between now and December 30th where like, Either like products are compliant or they're not, and sort of you'll see you know products that are like delisted and, and other things over that time, um, and you'll see a lot more products that are compliant come in, right? So I think you're going to see like while we're the first global stablecoin issuer and 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 we're one of a, a number of euro stablecoins that are authorized now, like I think you'll see more, right? So I think between now and the end of the year that like that will develop, but I think even more importantly over the medium to long term, right? A lot more players now that you have regulation are going to come into the market. I mean, SockGen launched a Euro stablecoin on public chains last week as well with permission um, through France. And, and that, that's a big deal, a major bank launching a free-floating uh, Euro stablecoin on permissionless blockchains. Like, that's a really big deal um, as well. So I think you'll see more things coming. 
And then there's sort of what the market is doing. I mean, like Binance had a big announcement the day uh, that we announced the USDC conformance, and they've been pretty clear about kind of how they're treating things, uh, and they're the biggest exchange in the world. And so I think sort of watch what market actors do uh, to kind of get a, an indication of, of, of how, how this kind of, we think, results in a kind of market structure shift. And we think that Europe is the beginning of that, like US is going to follow. Uh, we already have that in Japan. You have these rules coming up in a lot of places, and I, I think like globally regulated stablecoins are going to become a much larger thing as we go through 2025. And speaking of that, you know, structural change and, and new entrants and you know competition is is then the fact that USDC and EURC are now you know regulated under EU law. Is that going to be the main competitive edge um, going forward? And um, you know, how is this going to change the sort of share of market cap between the two biggest stablecoins? So, I mean, our focus is on building the world's largest, most active, actively used stablecoin network in the world. Um, and that's like a global initiative. Um, and so part of that is making sure that the stablecoins that we issue are legal and compliant everywhere in the world where they need to be. So that's just like a commitment that we've always made and that we're making. And so we think that if you wanna build a large stablecoin network that's broadly and actively used as a platform that developers build on, that you know households, corporations, other firms use, you, 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 we need to do that. Um, but you know we're, we're building that out in a lot of different ways. So we're building that out by building our own on-chain infrastructure that makes this super compelling for, for developers and for users by making USDC available on all these blockchain networks, by building new protocols like CCTP, which basically provides a safe, uh, secure, capital-efficient way to move value across these different blockchain networks and allow users of apps on different chains to be able to exchange value easily by investing in things like gasless transactions where people can onboard and just use stablecoins for fees and, and, and make, make payment transactions without needing to know about gas tokens and other things. So we're, we're investing in blockchain infrastructure that makes this really, really usable by both end users and developers, but we're also investing in, in liquidity. And so you know, in some ways, like the, the, the promise of liquidity is that wherever you are in the world, you can, you can get or redeem USDC as fast as possible, as cheap as possible within your, within your local banking system. And so we've been expanding internationally so that if you're in Singapore or in Hong Kong or in Mexico or Brazil or obviously here in Europe and the US that there's rails, there's actual underlying banking infrastructure um, that is available to all market participants um, to be able to seamlessly get and redeem that you know, safely. And that, that's a huge competitive differentiator for us is that like, we have this quality banking infrastructure everywhere in the world and we're accelerating that and expanding that through partnerships with leading banks uh, all around the world. And, and so that's key, just like, I think about it as like digital dollar dial tone or digital euro dial tone and like making that available all around the world. And so we have a huge, you know, we have a huge initiative there. And all those things are ultimately at the end of the day, it's about, you know, we build these developer platforms, we build this public infrastructure, we build this liquidity infrastructure. This is all just sort of part of setting this up for the next stage of growth in this market, which is just, we think more and more mainstream in terms of the adoption. And while we're still on stable coins before we move into you know, regulation, I've got a few questions on CBDCs and you know, the near future as well. But with the entry of PayPal's stable coin into the market, how, how do you see this impacting you know, the current sort of stable coin ecosystem? Or do you see it impacting it at all? Do you welcome the competition? Do you welcome uh, new entrants, generally speaking? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think the fact that we're getting more regulatory clarity is a great thing and will lead to far more you know, companies you know, wanting to compete in the space. The total addressable market for legal electronic money in the world today is over $100 trillion. That's the amount of legal electronic money there is in the world, uh, in, in different currencies, within all of the uh, banking systems globally, right? So you have this huge market of legal electronic money. The total amount of revenue generated from the payment utility on that is over $1.5 trillion. So you're talking about huge, huge markets. The internet has never actually like the media market, the communications market, like this is a big market, right? So this is absolutely gonna to attract tons of competition and tons of, of new companies and big established companies that have big user bases are gonna come in and say, hey, there's a lot at stake here. And so 
we, we definitely, we, we welcome it because of what it says is that like, yeah, this is a, this is a huge global market, right? So I think, you know, if there wasn't competition, there would be, no, there's no, there's, there's not a viable market, right? So, so that's, that's really important. And so we do wel welcome it. And every time one of these launches, I'm the first on Twitter to congratulate them and welcome them to the space because I really mean that. Um, and then, you know, we, we, you know, we compete on the basis of our product. We compete on the basis of like developer adoption and 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 you know all the things that we're building and and you know we've we've got a good track record. We feel really good about what we've been able to execute and we definitely feel like we're going to continue to be you know a pretty competitive company you know right now. It certainly looks that way with with the recent developments and and again while you know stable coins are often seen as the future of money, granted and as this huge addressable market, the potential is certainly there. But I have to ask you this because we are at ETC, where you know pro privacy sentiment is, is obviously fairly high. Uh, curious about your general consensus um, and thinking about privacy, and uh, I guess more specifically in terms of um, the way privacy is generally perceived here at ETC. Do your ambitions and aspirations for stable coins in any way support or or hinder privacy? Yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's a huge topic, obviously, and and I gave a talk actually yesterday, and I talked about there there. Are, couple of major unsolved issues in the broader adoption of this tech. If we want this to be billions of users and like every household or every corporation or like using this day to day, kind of like we use email or the web or social or other things, like, like we have to solve issues around identity, we have to solve issues around privacy, and we have to actually solve issues around the law. And what I mean by that is like, like there have to be legal definitions for well, like what on chain, like what it means to have value intermediated on chain or like a contract between parties that's executed on chain and enforceable on chain. And so there's like, there's a lot of open legal questions like what is a DAO? What's an on-chain organization? Like how's this all gonna work, right? That's gonna proliferate. So we need, we need, we need to like think about like how does law continue to adapt? We're not like, this isn't just about stablecoin regulation, it's about like society at large and, and, and how society deals with on-chain living and on-chain economics. But, Privacy is like one of those huge unsolved areas. And um, you know, right now there's a danger in my view, um, there's a danger that you know, things like stable coins, which are, are gonna proliferate and grow, they, they, there is privacy erosion that goes on with stable coins. Not necessarily because like a company like Circle is like looking over your transactions. We don't have the ability to do that. These are, these are digital tokens that are on blockchains, but there's now new tools for observation and that could be from a criminal bad actor, that could be from a government, that could be from your competitors. And so privacy, like there's privacy erosion. And so we need, we need to see improvements in privacy technology, on-chain privacy technology. We need, you know, whether it's, it's ZK or fully homomorphic encryption or other methods, we have to have deeper enhanced privacy. If I'm, uh, let, let's say I'm Siemens and I'm manufacturing products and I'm settling transactions between all my counterparties in different parts of the world and I'm using stablecoin rails to do that, like I don't want my competitors to be able to figure out what I'm doing and like look at my cash flows and like, so you need to be able to, even just for like a corporation, like the privacy uh, covenants that you can get from a blockchain right now are not sufficient actually to actually do work and households will feel the same way. And, and so there is, like that's a huge area that needs to be improved. And then obviously like how do you balance that with, you know, all of the kind of law enforcement, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, requests that, that are out there and that, that exists. We see those issues playing out in, in communications um, tools and, and various assertions of, of governments there. And so like how that gets resolved is like a huge open question because we, we, we need to simultaneously dramatically improve the privacy capabilities of on-chain um, existence um, and uh, enable also identity to work so that you know, whether you're a smart contract or a counterparty that I know you're provably human and you're, you know, you're, you're, you're provably like, you know, someone who's not a lawbreaker. Like there's gonna be all kinds of things that have to happen in terms of like the way identity proofs work. So these are like midterm things in my view that have to be worked on and we care a lot about all those issues because we think that without those getting resolved, we're not gonna, this isn't gonna be able to flourish uh, in the way that we think it can. Clear. And, and another discussion that sort of goes hand in hand with that um, is, is CBDCs. Uh, I know you have spoken about it in the past and you have written about it in the past. Um, I tend to generally agree with you, but you know, just for the sake of where we are and, and who the audience is, 
what are your general thoughts about CBDCs? Do we need them? Uh, do you see them as complementary to stable coins or is there a potential conflict of interest there? Can I get your sort of high level thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a few things. I think the, the first is sort of like, I, I'm, I, I like to describe myself as an internet maximalist. And so what do I mean by that? I mean, I believe that internet-based systems, open networks, open software, open source code, open protocols, and the continuous innovation cycle of entrepreneurs that are building on that stack is like this force that is growing and, and it's taking on more and more of the kind of infrastructure needs of society. And, and I think that's a very, very powerful force that, that compounds and, and like you see that in ECC right now, right? You this incredible range of people who are building code, a lot of it open source, contributing to this. The, the, the continuous improvement cycles are, are incredible. And so you don't want to lose that, right? That's so powerful. No government can compete with that. The, it, it's impossible for a government to compete with that. And so you want to harness that. And, and, and if you want innovation in monetary systems and financial systems and economic systems and, and, and you know, other, other uses of this technology as well, like you want to tap that, right? So my view has really been like the, the you know, open innovation and private sector innovation is like fundamental to how you're gonna improve monetary systems. And, um, and, and what's important is that the, the, the core infrastructure of fiat in this case, right, the core infrastructure in fiat should be improved um, and, and it should be upgraded to be built on newer technologies. Um, but that the intermediation of how users interact with that and the way in which it's, it's sort of the, the kind of technical innovation for how that actually gets out in the world should be like more of a free market um, activity. And so that, that's sort of my general view. And I think that's upheld by sort of how we've seen sort of internet and software technology adoption happen more broadly in the world. But that doesn't mean like you don't need central banks involved in say, who's issuing these digital currencies or how's it stored and you know their ability to set interest rate policy and like do all the things that are important there but it's not clear that that central banks themselves are going to be able to be like the actual technology innovators right i i think that they're that's that's unlikely to to play out Thank you for bringing some from some nuance to that. And I also want to ask you, uh, as a technologist and you know an internet maximalist, if you think about crypto's ethos of you know, decentralization, uh, immunity, uh, immutability, sorry, security, among some of the other principles that you just mentioned there, what might CBDCs uh, potentially mean for crypto's ability to deliver on that original ethos? I mean, I think crypto will just continue delivering on that original thesis, right? I mean, like, uh, I, I. I like my, my view is like uh, we're, we're in a uh, we're in a uh, a period of like immense uh, technical creativity and innovation and you know society is going to decide in the end uh, what is the best way to move forward and and so I I sort of um, I think policy and politics respond to society's uh, overall needs, demands, wants, uh, as opposed to the other way around. And so I think um, it's really incumbent on, you know, on the crypto industry to, to keep delivering value to society that society, you know, wants and, and doing that better and better. Uh, and if, and if, if the crypto industry can do that, then, you know, the, those, those, those deeply held beliefs and, and goals will be met and upheld. On that note of on the near future, how do you envision the future of money looking in the next decade? And what do you think the role of stable coins and, and DeFi as well is going to be in that in building that future? Yeah. So I talk a lot about this idea of the internet financial system. And and so in my in my mind, um, like we're in the early stages of the development of an actual internet based financial system where from the bottom up, it's built natively on the internet. And, and you know, at the base layer are these new internet operating systems that we call blockchain networks. And on top of those, um, you know, with, with regulation, right, we're issuing cash, digital cash instruments, right? That's what a stable point is. And so my view is that um, the, the internet financial system can be a safer, can be a more efficient, more inclusive, 
financial system than the current financial system. And I think at the core of that is this concept of full reserve money. So you have like this f fully reserved money, uh, not fractionally reserved money, you have fully reserved money that exists in the form of stable coins. And I think the closer that those can get to being kind of the you know, kind of cash equivalency with a central bank, the better. And, um, and, and then what you do is you marry that to the, what I kind of describe as the physics of the internet, which is sort of this, the ability to have vo the velocity of money basically you know, be the, the sort of this, the speed and throughput of the internet, which is effectively kind of this inst you know, infinite velocity, right? You have this, the speed of, 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 of you know, essentially light, right? You're, you're, you're able to have value move with such speed and such velocity that you're able to do that with as safe of an asset as possible. And that's where I think what we think of as DeFi today really comes in, which is if you have a full reserve digital currency, whether it's a euro digital currency, dollar digital currency, and you have on-chain infrastructure for intermediation, you can actually build a, a far more safe and efficient and transparent and well-risk managed intermediation model than the legacy banking system. And so my own view is that like on-chain financial primitives, whether it's you know, uh, borrow, lend, save, invest, swap, exchange, you know, option, you know, future, like all these like primitives that we think of, which we're already seeing, these are on-chain. When you start to build those up and you build those up uh, you know, in, in this infrastructure and, and then financial firms and, and commercial firms and others can start to utilize that, you actually can build, you're, you're basically building a, a, a better financial system from the ground up natively. And, and with inherently, I believe, it can be done in a way which is, has less risk uh, in it and, and, and more transparency and, um, uh, you know, obviously uh, more accessibility and, and, uh, and inclusion. So, I mean, those are all the goals, but I, I really think that those are possible, and, and we're, but we're at the very start of that. We're at the very early stages of that right now. So in 10 years, I think we'll be a lot further. Can't wait to catch up with you in 10 years. I know you're on a very tight schedule, Jeremy. Just before we let you go, we are in a bull market that's, that's you know, been playing out a little differently to previous cycles. Uh, we like to ask our guests this question just before we let them go. Could you please give us some alpha? <laughs> so, you know, I, I had a post uh, on X uh, recently where the headline was like, I am more bullish than I've ever been about crypto. And I really am. And I think that that perspective and is, is, is sort of, I've been working on this for 11 years and I've sort of seen not just the 11 years in crypto, but I've seen many, many technology market cycles uh, as well in the internet as a whole dating back to like 1990. So I've sort of seen decades of sort of these cycles of technology adoption, improvement, market activity, et cetera. And like my view is, is when, I, when I sort of try and place at a moment in time, it's, it's oftentimes useful to look at history and sort of say, where are we relative to when the internet was like this or the internet was like that? And, and you know, you see these charts of like crypto and the adoption cycle and it's at 200, 300 million people and it means it's going to explode to billions or whatever. It's probably true. But I think um, it feels to me when I look at the combination of the maturity of blockchain network infrastructure, some of the fundamental primitives that are becoming possible in terms of user experience and abstracting away the complexity of interacting with this technology and the legal certainty that's coming that's really really important when you when you put those those things together it really feels like we're 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 coming onto that moment where this can really really go to internet scale and so my own view is that um, you know, we, we, like 2025 is going to be, like 2024, we're in it. I think it, we're, we're in an improving environment. I think 2025 is going to be a really extraordinary environment. And I'm not focused on prices of crypto assets. I'm focused on how this technology is being built on and used. And I think 2025 is going to be a really significant year. And I think we'll, we'll, we'll be, you know, there's lots of uh, these concepts of crossing the chasm, which is an old concept in technology adoption life cycles. And crossing the chasm is like when you go from the early adopter phase to the what's called the early majority. And that's like the steep slope. And so I think we're, we're, we're right now crossing the chasm. And so I think that steep slope is, 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 uh, is 
coming in the next uh, year or so. I can't wait to catch up with you in the near future. Thank you so much for taking the time to sit down and talk to us. Really appreciate your time. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.